Today we have um, Dr. Yogi Hendlin. Um, he's going to talk about, well, the talk is entitled Taking the Tripping Out of Psychedelic Medicine is a Mistake. Um, Yogi is an assistant professor in the Erasmus School of Philosophy and uh, a sustainability leader at Erasmus University. He's a research associate of, uh, in the Environmental Health Initiative at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, he's the editor-in-chief of the Interdisciplinary Philosophy of Biology Journal, Biosemiotics, and he thrives on questions concerning life, agency, consciousness, and interspeciality. So can you all please welcome Yogi Henry. Thank you so much for coming, for being here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here with the group. Um, I met you both at the uh, um, ICPR uh, in Harlem uh, just uh, yeah, a month ago, maybe. So um, yeah, serendipity brought us here. Question, is that comfortable for you, for that to be down, or are you going to fall asleep? Or do you prefer up? For the I am well comfortable because otherwise we've got people with my eyes. Understood. Okay, so we've got sort of like a moody thing going. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, first of all, I uh, wanted to just um, say some of the things that I'd love to, to hear your opinion about. I've been thinking about a lot, what is our experience when we experience uh, psychedelic states or mystical states? Um, because I see psychedelics as a subset of a larger set of experiences, which, um, you know, Evan Thompson talks about in his uh, Being Waking Dreaming, for example. Um, and, you know, some people call it the yeah, parapsychology, uh, but um, I, I think all of these distinctions themselves um, reinforce and reiterate the same logics of domination, separation, and dichotomization uh, that um, psychedelics provide us an insight into overcoming. So that's what I'm going to share with you, and I hope to have this conversation around how do we approach um, the, 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 the psychedelic, or as I'll be referring to it as ecodelic experience, um, not as a sort of a substance essentialist uh, point of view, um, not as an individual point of view, but as rather a uh, as a process philosophy, uh, as a uh, collective experience, which is, um, yeah, as has been said for probably time memorial, uh, set in a setting. Um, <clears throat> so a recent article in Nature, the journal, uh, proclaims the promise of, quote, taking the tripping out of psychedelic medicine, uh, drugs under development, offer the mental health benefits of psilocybin and, and similar substances, LSD, or um, sort of their uh, new versions of LSD, without inducing strong hallucinatory effects, close quote. Such promises of delivering the therapeutic benefits without the possibly unnerving distortions of default reality uh, that come uh, with psychedelics has become big business. There are many reasons why the current medical establishment would uh, wish to take the trip out of tripping. Uh, viewed as next generation SSRIs, uh, selective serotonin reuptake re inhibitors, engineered psychedelics are positioned to be the next big pharmaceutical breakthrough. Designer psychedelics based on tryptamines or psilocybin, for example, may allow for shorter experiences, require less therapist time, uh, be less burdensome for them, or uh, be, have, uh, carry less hallucinatory experiences for those unwilling uh, to confront them. And I think that this is the, the key bit because the sort of value add here are all of those things. It takes less time. It, um, yeah, it doesn't require as much labor on the part of space holders, uh, but almost, I would say more importantly, it doesn't, um, require uh, uh, the confrontations which psychedelics and mystical experiences uh, I, I see um, are constituted by. So, you know, there's the, the question of, can we have healing 
in the way that we think of psychedelic experiences as being healing or transformative. When you are focusing on it only on a biochemical molecular <laughs> level, is are you getting the whole thing? Right. We we know, for example, um, that with other plants, when you take out, for example, the terpenes, that you're missing all these synergistic effects, right? Uh, that are protective of some of the uh, poisons that might be inherent in that um, element as well. And so there's there's this notion, you know, of course, of, uh, of uh, the pharmacon, um, and when we selectively uh, choose what we want, like with CRISPR-Cas9, for example, we are um, deciding where things will be. As one of my mentors, Merdine Anderson writes, um, natural selection is uh, proscriptive. It says, no, 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 you can't do all these things. And then it leaves a little opening. But it doesn't say what needs to happen with that little opening. It can go in many different directions, right? It leaves this uh, sort of, um, this, uh, we call it in, in biosemiotics, we would use the term enabling constraints. Um, but uh, artificial selection, on the other hand, and I've written about this in an article in the Journal of Biosemiotics uh, called, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> oh, what's it called? Uh, anyhow, um, I, I talk about um, artificial selection as uh, almost a, a form of human devolution. Why? Because instead of being proscriptive, it's prescriptive. It's saying, I want that at all costs. I want that. And who cares, bollocks to everything else because we'll deal with that later with something else and kicking the can down the road um, as it were. And so this prescriptivity or prescriptiveness, the term is, results in leaving out the magic as it were. And the magic, I don't see as a uh, purely metaphysical magic, but in fact, a highly um, biochemical, uh, aspect as well, right? Taking a biopsychosocial model of health and medicine. So one could say the most parsimonious explanation, however, for engineering psychedelics is to be safer for not the patient, but for pharmaceutical companies. Um, because when you um, engineer a molecule that is in the common it's in the public domain. Nobody owns the molecular structure of psilocybin or LSD. <clears throat> then, um, yeah, you, you can own it, right? You can take it out of the global commons. You tweak it. It's, it's like uh, remixing or what I, I would say the analog would be um, Monsanto uh, taking a corn uh, seed, genetically engineering it, and now saying we own all seeds that have this specific uh, genetic modification. And so if you want to get that thing, you either have to pay us to get it, or if by some chance your corn has crossbred with uh, our variety, we will sue you to get money back because your corn has our patented mark on it, right? And this I see as an analogy to what uh, pharmaceutical companies are trying to do uh, with proprietary ownership. By tweaking these substances, companies' manipulation of them under current IP law allows them to own these new variants. Uh, these new variants, which then of course will have hundreds of millions uh, of pounds uh, campaigns to do all the necessary trials to show that it's actually safe and effective and more efficient or uh, therapeutic medicalized use. And thus, um, <clears throat> yeah, they can promote them as the designer, get them medically approved through these huge bureaucratic systems. Um, and then this medically approved version becomes uh, sort of the coin of the realm for taking that substance and getting uh, sort of insurance or a public health uh, um, funds to cover it. And this allows them, of course, to create monopolies, as, which, as Peter Thiel reminds us, is actually a good thing, despite what we might have been taught um, if we uh, you know, learned about Marx or something. 
In the end, however, one could say it's all about money. But is this conclusion too simple? Is it premature? Thinking of psychedelics as just another form of drug, right? As something that's substitutable, interchangeable with the sort of drugs we have for um, the mental health disorder, um, which have had diminishing returns, one could say, or to put it less um, charitably, as soon as the patents ran out on many of these drugs, um, they uh, sort of released the floodgates of the um, negative externalities or the side effects of them, whereas previously um, those were uh, restrained. Um, you know, perhaps uh, thinking of, of psychedelics um, as just another one of these things that we can infinitely remix and engineer to get our desired outcome with no remainder may be convenient, but I'm going to argue that it is incorrect or, or wrong. And the, there's various dimensions. I mean, I could say it's ethically wrong, right? But ethics doesn't bake much bread, as we know. I'm uh, originally a political theorist. And um, anytime we have ethics as an add-on, they're sort of already lost. You know? No tyrant has ever bowed before you know, ethics, you could say. Um, so in what other ways could it be wrong? Um, and, and I'm going to argue that it's wrong in that it doesn't actually achieve the emancipatory potential of the substance. Uh, and I'll get to that in a little bit. <clears throat> Such a pharmaceuticalized view of psychedelics uh, or ecodelics, as uh, I will call them, uh, following Richard Doyle in Darwin's Pharmacy, uh, follows the same substance essentialism, which takes the set and setting of global capitalism and its discontents out of the equation. Instead, uh, individuals are the masters of their own destinies and should be superheroes flourishing despite all odds, uh, right? Uh, never, mind, never mind the man behind the curtain or in this case, the society behind the individual. So in this account, um, self-medicating or uh, creating the, uh, you know, the society where we are responsible for our own mental health um, and yes, that can include a bevy of interventions which our society provides for us, is nonetheless an individual enterprise. It's something that happens despite the work pressure, despite the stress, despite the polluted air, water, soil, rising temperature, right? The contamination, the pollution of the elements. Um, so, the, the psychedelic side uh, as aspects, the psychedelic aspects of psychedelics are considered by mainstream medicine to be downsides or, and these are quotes from the article, or side effects rather than constitutive parts of the healing properties that make them medicines by those who have used them uh, historically as medicines. As the Nature article explains, quote, their perception distorting effects make them ill-suited for individuals who might not respond respond well to hallucinations or other sensory alterations, close quote. But what if the hallucination and sensory alterations are precisely the medicine needed for the deeper healing? What if without these attributes, the real healing doesn't happen? And people continue destroying themselves and the planet and everyone around them uh, because they're not actually getting the thing. You know, only now with their engineer designer psychedelic, which is no longer considered psychedelic in this new medicalized, pharmaceuticalized, individualized, responsibilitized uh, uh, fashion, um, that their body and mind's instinctual circuit breakers, which were breaking, have just been granted a little bit more reprieve, right? Thanks to the titration of this designer psychedelic. Is artificially prolonging fatigue progress? Or is such an instrumental approach merely making things worse? Whereas a biopsychosocial model of health and illness takes into account how social forces cause disease, the aim of current pharmaceuticalized psychedelics research acts as a buttress for unsustainable social, uh, a buttress for unsustainable social and environmental conditions. That is, they are being 
galvanized to sustain the unsustainable. The turn to psychedelics as a last resort to keep people from shorting out, right, miracle drugs, um, from unbearable life conditions of domination, oppression, and ecological destruction is accompanied by a movement to delete their emancipatory potential. And by emancipatory, I mean not just um, whatever versions of emancipatory that we take uh, to be uh, the case in a sort of um, Elon Musk retreat to New Zealand bunker, Mars tech bro notion of emancipation. emancipation right? I'm talking about a sort of a, a, a historical notion, um, which I'll get back to uh, towards the end of the talk, um, that is, one could say, uh, <laughs> for, for uh, just a, a gloss or a metonymy for many traditions, is, is Buddhist, right? Uh, it's triple gen. Buddha, you could say the uh, Dharma and, and Sangha, right? So yeah, the, the, the path, the, the way, Buddha here being uh, Soma of one sort or another, Dharma, what one does with it, and uh, Sangha as being a community, a spiritual community that upholds and enables and supports and you know, is the in la kesh of I am another you. And those who are doing the work on this earth right now, who are very clear that there is no liberation, there is no enlightenment until we are all enlightened, until we're all liberated. And this, we could say, again, glossing, because many traditions hold this to be true, uh, is the Bodhisattva tradition in, in Buddhism. Rather than embracing the disruptive technology of psychedelics, which will, if properly used, help people fundamentally change their mind, as Michael Pollan says, and more importantly, their actions and relations to the earth, others, and withdraw from the structures of domination vampirizing us, the pharmaceuticalization of psychedelics risks converting them into yet another instrument of apologetics for capitalism. Right? It's a form of colonizing psychedelics, a form of colonizing the plant world, colonizing the uh, world of fungi and, and others. <clears throat> the current financial pharmaceutical nexus of interests in psychedelics, um, I argue, is largely aimed at sustaining unsustainable social structures, uh, such as economic and social in inequality and, and inequity rather than uh, embracing psychedelics traditional uh, place in society, their purpose and role as being socially, politically, and only uh, concomitantly psychologically uh, transformative. Right. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm making the case and the argument that uh, psychedelics have been used <laughs> for thousands of years uh, in community traditions not to um, allow for structures of domination to continue, but to disrupt them. There's, for example, a community in Peru that once a year, they have a day where everybody fights each other. Any, any grudge you hold against, you literally duke it out. Fist, no, no weapons allowed. But you see women fighting each other, pulling each other's hair, and it's a safe space, a safe container to let out the pent up uh, uh, energies, emotions, um, which have accumulated in community living, right? In Ecotopia, um, there's the, the book uh, from the 70s, there's, there's this passage about the importance of basing a society on uh, evolutionary anthropology, right? To really acknowledge rather than gaslight the fact that we do have certain triba or drives that can be very socially dysfunctional, asocial, and, and also that can cause, um, uh, you could say when, when not expressed um, and, and rather repressed, and of course Freud talks about this a bunch, um, can lead to all sorts of pathologies. And I would argue that um, the reason why all of our societies, especially in the Western world are running on fumes is that we have so much of this excess or baggage or 
you know, the dam is uh, so uh, full of these repressed emotions that haven't had an outlet that we are, you know, eating each other alive and ourselves, you know, and if we're being good, we eat ourselves a lot, right? If we're being bad, we eat others. Um, but it's the same, say, gesture of, of trying to be free, time, trying to free ourselves, racking, you know, this, we're being racked uh, by certain um, energies that we don't know what to do with because we don't have a culture that has a healthy outlet for them. And psychedelics allows for these traumas to have a place to reconcile themselves um, in oneself when used as directed. And of course, when I'm saying when used as directed, I'm not taking a monological uh, notion of that, but rather a pluralistic one uh, that is nonetheless based in the plurality of ways in which they have traditionally uh, with, with much utility been, been used for community and healing. David Abram, of course, talks about um, how we spread disease around, right? You go to the hospital, you get an operation, right? You're sick from something. And um, since medical waste is 5% of the UK um, CO2 emissions, medical waste in the UK is 5% of all the, <laughs> the greenhouse gases that are emitted in this country. Okay, so, so where are they getting the plastics and the metals and all of this complex stuff that's discarded after, you know, after use? Where, where's it going? Where, where's it going and where does it come from? And who's dying as a result? So for us not to die, other people are dying in our current system. We're spreading disease around, we're displacing it. We're, uh, as Ulrich Beck would say, we're um, uh, distantiating disease rather than curing it and healing it because we're not getting to the uh, holistic or the uh, fractal or the queer diagonal ways in which disease and health exist. Not that disease is avoidable. That's not the claim I'm making. I, you know, I think that suffering uh, is, is uh, our, uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of what we're um, tasked with. The question is how do you make beauty out of the suffering? And psychedelics help us make beauty out of the suffering, make it meaningful, and also make it so that we don't cause more suffering in dealing with that suffering that we're experiencing, right? The amelioration of suffering through uh, good works. And good works is not some just Christian or, or Greek ideal. It's, it's also uh, reading. It's also uh, tending one's garden. It's also, it, it can be completely interior. It's invisible, right? Who knows if it's uh, all the people praying and meditating in caves who we've never met or heard their name, we're keeping this world from being blown up to this by nuclear weapons. We don't know. So ecodelics are, are meant to change social relations and relationships between people and their environment, not just spread disease around, not just keep it at bay either, right? Because we, we see what happens to people who are kept at bay, autoimmune disorders, for example. To cut off ecodelic uh, chance, uh, or you know, to for us to understand nature on a deeper level, um, is to use them as a weapon, not as a medicine. It is to extract or dry out these medicines, which are holistic by design. Not just holistic for a given body, but for the entire web of relations. Harmony does not. Uh, or comes not through enabling continued bad behavior um, and damaged subjectivities, Adorno, uh, based on exploitation, extraction, and abuse, whether intentional or not, but rather through attuning broken people to their broken environments so that in their pool of grief and despair, they can tap into their native humility and compassion for themselves and others, and through experiencing that and realizing it, and not fearing it and not fighting against it can, can come to shift things, can come back into an ebb and a flow, can get rid of the staticness that feels so overwhelming and totalizing when we are in uh, these sort of atrophied or ossified structures. 
the, the pharmaceutical industry wants to hijack psychedelics to quote uh, their ability for their ability to rewire the brain without the messy bit about rewiring society. They want to keep power relations fixed and stable, even if the current order keeps people and planet in a constant state of woundedness, thus requiring ever new technologies like psychedelics to deal with the mounting side effects of industrial culture. Companies are manipulating tryptamines to create uh, short-term one hour experiences to provide some therapeutic benefit without uh, really making people make the commitments to the typical six to 12 hour LSD trip. Quote, it will be much less resource intensive in terms of therapist time and the burden on the healthcare system reported. I, I love this, Gilgamesh Pharmaceuticals. Um, right. uh, the, the psychedelic light recipes aim to make psychedelics safe for also our current expropriated labor system. Uh, are you burnt out? Just take this. We already are in that culture, but now psychedelics are being um, sort of harnessed to that end. And if that's what we think psychedelics are, maybe there'll be actually less people believing that there is something more, that there is a real thing called psychedelics or a real state that's outside this totalizing sort of breakdown, right? Or, or this, this, to, this totalizing um, sort of uh, iron grip that people might feel themselves in. So even if their bodies and minds are able to somehow survive, they are still working for a world that is destroying them. Instead of having a designated sitter or a group setting of experienced people, or hey, an experienced friend, we are stressing to fit psychedelic experience and its benefits into the unchangeable, unbreakable uh, uh, model of, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, uh, you know, uh, medicine. In ancient uh, Greek medicine, the doctor was not paid unless the patient recovered, right? Now, if you go in for an operation, you see 20 different people. Once you never see them again, you get ping ponged around like a, a arcade game from, from one person to the next. The, where's the sense of you know, uh, trust, uh, building relationships, uh, you know, the, the, the placebo of, uh, of, of love? Um, it, it's, it's not there. And, and you pay no matter the outcome because whatever the outcome is, somebody else will deal with it later. It's, it's, it's like the society of infinite side effects they always require something else, a new, greater technology to fix it. Um, you know, it's called the techno technology trap, uh, uh, in the words of others. Um, and, you know, the, the aim that you, you could say the, the dystopian aim of this, if we, you know, accept that um, as, as a potential dystopic future, would be for everyone to get their daily drip of microdose rather than gunning down their classmates. And, and I think that's you know, much better than gunning down your classmates. But you know, I, I think that we need to be aware and um, you know, uh, at, at some of the brave new world aspects uh, that are um, incipient in this model. Um, you know, rather than having burnout or otherwise breaking from breaking down uh, in, in the Netherlands, we have this huge thing called burnout, which everybody has, and it's socially acceptable to have burnout. You take some time off, you might change careers and you go in another direction. It's socially acceptable, which I think is marvelous. I see it as a positive thing, not a negative, because I come from California where you are, you know, the United States has no social safety net, probably like here. You know, if you fail, if you fall, if you stumble, if you make a mistake, you're dead. You're literally on the streets with no resources and can die very quickly if you don't have family and friends and connections. Um, and you know, we are all, uh, you could say, uh, um, you know, uh, we're all hypocrites in a way uh, as educators because we're always told you know, uh, in new education models, we need to teach our students that it's okay to make mistakes. We need to encourage mistake making because that enables people, you know, um, in, in the tech world, they say fail hard, fail faster, fail faster. 
right? Because then eventually you'll get, you know, it's like the Edison principle. You fail 10,000 times, then you get the light bulb, even though he stole it from Tesla and others. Um, but this idea that you're allowed to fail is pure imagination in our current social structure. And so there's a huge disjunct, right? And, you know, there, there is, you know, not breaking in a sense, in a very shriveled sense from our broken society, but we never break open our head. We never break open the head. There's no breaking convention here in this model. Psychedelics are instead put to use um, as one more or one last prop to hold up a crumbling empire. Medicalized, pharmaceuticalized psychedelic research aims to find safety in the trip, to rewire our brains safely in a way that is not going to have us opt out of society, right? There was in the US, I don't know if you know, a huge discourse of why aren't people going to work after COVID? Ah, they got paid $2,000 once. That's why nobody wants to work. Not the low wages, you know, not the uh, sort of crumbling uh, social structure, not, um, you know, the anxiety, uh, climate change. No, it's people are lazy, right? That's the mythology that we've been fed. And so, you know, the, the idea is instead of questioning the narrative, instead, psychedelics have to be engineered out from helping us question the narrative. No, they need to only do maintenance. If we could, we would just unleash all these CRISPR-Cas9 uh, viruses or uh, mRNA to turn off our anxiety, uh, and then we could just go back uh, and, and you know, business as usual and work in society and be good worker bees. Never mind, you know, stay, uh, uh, keep calm and carry on. Um, but in trying to engineer. And this goes back to the proscription versus prescription uh, distinction that I made at the outset between natural selection and artificial selection. In trying to engineer how um, psychedelics can be made safe for capitalism, to rewire our brain safely to not have us disrupt the system that we are caught up in, are we not even playing with a greater fire? Haven't we already proven that not all brains are the same? For example, uh, those of you who know Nesbitt and et al's work on weird society, uh, Western, uh, educated, industrialized, rich democracies, and um, all the work on uh, looking at how, you know, this myth of neurobiology propagated, uh, you know, for, for the last 20, 30 years, how that we're all the same on the inside. And this is supposed to lead us to a kumbaya moment where you know, human rights can finally reign because we all have the same neurobiology, turns out to be completely false. It's predicated on studies done 70% American, uh, 90 to 95% Western, almost all white undergraduates. That's our model of the brain. Our model of the brain is an abstraction. It's what I call a Vitruvian man. It's a standard and let, let alone if we talk about averages and statistics and how that works and how all this information gets assimilated so many times that all the outliers get excluded to make nice data sets. So not all brains are the same. And so if psychedelic experience is set in setting, including our neurobiological, cultural, linguistic, ecological set and setting. What does that mean for trying to engineer homogeneity? And why are we trying to engineer homogeneity, homo homogeneous outcomes, right? Like depression reduced 20%, yay! Um, and, and so we, we need to change our, our, our social, global, existential set and setting is, is my argument. Uh, if we want people to get, um, the, the true uh, potential of, of these trips, you know, out of their substances. If we want, you know, to, to have, I, I'm also arguing that none of us have had the type of psychedelic experience that we have, 
could have if we lived in a um, mutualistic, uh, 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 yeah, e uh, richer ecological setting. And, and the, here I borrow from Dale Pendle in his Palenque del Norte two, 2006 Burning Man lectures on horizon anarchy. And he says, you know, we have no idea what our potential is because we're constrained by our, um, our uh, yeah, socio-political economic structure. We have no idea what we're even capable of. We don't know what the homo, sapien, homo sapiens is. We, we are at this certain juncture and, and we you know, call it progress for, for some strange reason, but the, the idea you know, that we can future cast, right? Um, at my university, we have the conceit of preaching that we teach proof, future proof education. Right, with zero hands-on, zero, no learning how to garden, no mental health, uh, anything like that. And this idea that the future will look anything like it does now, one way or another, is part of this continuous progressivist model, which came, uh, I would say, uh, with monotheism, but especially uh, with Christianity. Um, and that we are still taking this into what the potential of these substances are because we are thinking of them as separate from us, right? We are, we have this Ouroboros loop of filtering uh, our uh, possibilities of what they are because we are constraining ourselves by our current system and we can't help but constrain ourselves. I'm not saying that heroics, again, I'm not arguing for heroics. I'm arguing for system change. And you could, could also argue, you know, what about pleasure? Um, our pharmaceutical companies also in or advertently engineering out the pleasure of psychedelic experiences, making them into a routinized, boring way of taking medicine. It will just keep your head enough above water so you don't snap. You really have to wonder what's behind the motivations of these, these science. And I'm not ascribing um, you could say responsibility precisely because I don't think it's conscious. I think it's a more automaton uh, action rather than automatic. <clears throat> we can recall, um, you know, this, this idea, uh, like James uh, Fadiman says, let's engineer the pleasure out of sex. Who needs all those messy feelings, right? Uh, the uh, long-termists and effective altruists were also sort of making this argument. Um, you know, let's just, who cares about those forms of pleasure? They're not as important as our grand vision, our Lagrangian of what we would like to create uh, for our utilitarian structure. Um, so, you know, it, is the problem with psych psychedelics being uh, too destabilizing, right? If you look at the adaptive cycle of Gunderson and Hawley, um, is it, is it scary uh, that psychedelics um, could lead us to these, these uh, schisms, these caesuras with what is as our, our, our social structure? Or is the problem of how we conceive of patience, suffering, and consciousness? Ha have we sort of glommed on to assumptions about what it means to be a patient, what it means to suffer, you know, what, it, what consciousness is that get in our way of understanding their emancipatory potential. Um, and, you know, Terence McKenna talks about in uh, Food of the Gods, um, how the discovering of morphine was intended to be without the ill effects of opium and to help get people off of opium. And then heroin was invented to help combat the ill effects of morphine to get people off uh, uh, morphine. Um, and, and we saw how, how good that worked out, right? And then fentanyl was supposed to help people, you know, the effects of psychedelics that you know raises um, the most moral outrage, right? May be their main effect. Um, yeah. So let's see. I'll just conclude now. I think time-wise. Um, Michael Martyr. Uh, good friend of mine in, in his uh, more recent book, Dump Philosophy, he writes, in keeping with the line of ancient reasoning, 
The body and its senses are microcosms that set apart for the time being and in varying proportions, a tiny fraction of immense elemental regions. It is we who are in the elements you know, as their proportionate and temporary circumscriptions. When proportions are out of whack, the imbalance restitutes a bulk of the delimited to exteriority. When the outside regions themselves are deranged and contaminated, so are their bounded segments. Toxic elements, toxic bodies, and senses make. And since the mind is embodied, the list remains partial without toxic thoughts, desires, fantasies, and modes of reasoning that have, to be sure, also occasioned the uh, um, evisceration of the world. So um, there, there's, there's something that, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to necessarily dwell on, but I, I think it's, it's worth at least mentioning with this current paradigm and regime of the uh, cannibalization or wetikoization of psychedelics, divorcing psychedelics from their ecodelic context of traditions that evolve from those psychedelic communal experiences. And here there's Hanlon's razor, best articulated by Napoleon Bonaparte. Never ascribe to malice that which can be adequately explained by incompetence. This would suggest that in defaming psychedelics, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, as Ivan Illich put it. But perhaps we should also take into account Fred Clark's law, of course, built on um, Arthur C. Clark's law. Sufficiently advanced incompetence is indistinguishable from malice. My main impetus at this point is critiquing the current gold rush of medicalizing and pharmaceuticalizing substances to take the trip out uh, in order to make these substances easily administrable like Huxley's soma and conducive rather than confronting to dominating systems of control. Hewing closely to, the, to traditions from whence these ecodelics come, decentering the substances as such, it's not about the substance. It's not just, it's incidental. Allows us to zoom out instead of, instead appreciating the ecology and social context in which they are taken as occasional sacraments, not as routine SSRIs. This ecological argument dovetails which, with much of my other work, um, you know, critiquing copy-paste mindfulness meditation and business contexts, uh, looking at um, 5EA uh, COGSI, um, uh, you know, looking at how <laughs> so much of, of, of what we confront and inherit is being not used for liberation, personal or collective, but for maintenance of a sick system. The paradox of awareness is that what we are not aware of can parasitize us. Once we become aware of these blind spots and our own ignorance, the best thing we can do is to dwell in it and integrate fully that awareness so that we cease to need to be aware of being aware of those aspects. This does not mean that we cease to be aware of those aspects, but rather that they are integrated into a greater whole of awareness that periodically will require revisiting and uh, profundization. I, it's a portmanteau of like profundizar in Spanish, I guess we would say enrich. Uh, this is very similar to the dialectic of enlightenment, but not the Western one, but the Buddhist one. And in answer to our little conversation earlier, this is what I mean. First you have, unconscious incompetence. Then you learn and you have conscious incompetence. And then you get to the place where you can be consciously competent and then you become unconsciously competent. And this is mastery. This is also um, you know, one, one way of looking at some of Heidegger's work uh, also. So to conclude a dose of LSD you know, has the same name as a pop song a hit. 
If psychedelic medicine becomes reduced to nothing more than a flood of comfort engineered by corporations and government to mollify us further, inure us to the unhappy situa situation of domination of life on our planet, we will have lost something considerable. If we get to the point that psychedelics have no more natality, as Hannah Arendt envisioned it, then pop songs, no more natality than a pop song, then we are in trouble. And perhaps we will have failed to grasp the true emancipatory potential of these sacred medicines. As Henri Bergson reminds us, we must speak of an in, why must we speak? Why, why, why must we speak of an inert matter to which life and consciousness would be inserted as a frame? By what right do we put the inert first? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Shogi. Uh, fascinating talk. I uh, will have questions now, and I'll try to alternate between the, uh, the in-person people here and those online if there are questions. And can I also ask that you speak very loudly when you ask a question for this owl microphone here at the camera? <laughs> Okay, um, Osiris online, with a question, please. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. I, I have a um, a straight question. Uh, I agree, for example, with, with the idea to, to change the existential global set and setting. I guess that this is a very important, uh, you know, um, fact. Uh, my, my question is the next. Could you explain a little bit more the emancipatory potential for psychedelics? Because it's, uh, it's not very common, for example, in the mainstream uh, discourse of psychedelics, for example, to highlight the emancipatory potential. And this emancipatory potential is mainly focused on political emancipation, uh, psychological emancipation, social emancipation, cultural em emancipation, and, and so on. Will you explain a little bit more about this? Thank you. Thank you, Osiris. Uh, that's, uh, I don't, can you see me? Yeah. Should I look up here? Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. Um, so obviously this is more than I can answer uh, because if I knew the answer, I would be doing everything I could to, to, to do something about it. And I am, uh, despite not having the answer to that. Um, but I would also just include that uh, there's, there's also the technological um, emancipation that's necessary, which um, requires us to not, uh, Herbert Marcuse talked about erotic technologies, right? Uh, the idea that we need a technological pluralism. Um, Julia Watson has most recently in her bespoke book, um, Low Tech, uh, uh, designed for radical indigenism, tech being traditional ecological knowledge, she uh, goes around the world and shows how local peoples uh, for hundreds, thousands of years have found ways to use um, ecological uh, 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 surroundings as technologies to meet all of their needs. For example, in India, in uh, harshly tropical rainforests where uh, bridges of wood or of metal would not work because they would get corroded so quickly. It would last for maybe five years before being rusted out. They have for many hundreds of years uh, trained vines to, create, to cross rivers and gorges. So they have these, uh, these bridges made of vines that can support oxen, you know, can support 20 people crossing them. And they, this is a process of complete, uh, uh, constant making, they're constantly reweaving the vines uh, in order to make their bridge stronger. Um, I think that this needs to be a part of it, um, of, of psychedelics emancipatory potential. Now, to get back to your question of like, so, okay, so how are psychedelics 
emancipatory rather than just another um, experience that can get subsumed into or, or cannibalized by um, capitalistic colonial culture. I don't think that they are or can be on their own because I don't believe in psychedelics. I believe in ecodelics. If you take uh, LSD or psilocybin at a rave, I think that you're not going to have an emancipatory potential necessarily. I think it will happen in some because there is a um, sometimes so much of a radical break uh, as Ian McGilchrist talks about in his works uh, uh, on the matter of things and the master and his emissary, um, I, I believe that psychedelics helps open up the corpus callosum that connects the left and right hemispheres and helps uh, alleviate the dominating um, uh, co concept uh, um, sort of schublade, the, the sort of uh, boxing in of um, reality into predetermined categories with the uh, right hemisphere of the brain's novelty, natality, openness to newness, right? So I do think that on just a biochemical level, there is that emancipatory potential, but I do believe that there is a threshold which is far above what these uh, pharmaceuticalized and medicalized um, regimes want to use that that breaking open the head requires. That's why the heroic dose that's the only thing, that's the only her heroism that I will go with, right? I won't go with individualistic heroism, but the heroic dose that Paul Stamets talks about in uh, Fantastic Fungi, which opened him to his reality of who he is. I, I do think that overdosing on psychedelics is a way to get to that chaos phase where you have no choice but to relinquish control. But all of this, in terms of this emancipatory potential can only happen in a, I would say a dedicated real sort of yogic way where there is a community and an algorithm that's not one thing or another, but a sort of, you could say a collectively sourced, collectively, uh, 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 Charles Sanders Peirce calls it like the faneron, um, you know, this, uh, this uh, newosphere algorithm which emerges out of collective experience of taking uh, ecodelics with specific um, emancipatory goals and potential with that intention and with that follow through because anybody who's ever had an ayahuasca experience knows that it's not about the ayahuasca experience. It's about what you do before and what you do after. What did you eat? Have you changed your diet afterwards? Have you done your homework? You know, if you don't do your homework, you could take as much ayahuasca as you want and you're still gonna be a douchebag. I've, you know, I know enough of these people. Um, I was one of these people, right? I speak from experience. Thank you. Another question, please. Yep. Um, so I have a bit of a background in um, civil resistance um, and um, the co-founder of the Extinction Rebellion movement is Gail Bradbrook. She's uh, big into psychedelics. Um, she herself was profoundly changed by an ayahuasca experience. Um, I think there's other, other compounds in the mix, including Iboga as well. Uh, and she talks a lot about what you talked about, including the concept of Wetiko. She has proposed uh, that a way that we could uh, yeah, push, the, push the boat in the right direction is by basically having psychedelic civil disobedience. In other words, like mushroom eats out in public. Uh, do you have any sympathy with that idea? Well, funny you should mention this because I, uh, so I live in the Netherlands and I teach in Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. And I was just contacted by a colleague who works with Extinction Rebellion Rotterdam on this very question to give advice yeah. about it. Small world. <laughs> it's like, I didn't sign up for this, but of course this is like exactly what I want to do. Um, so of course, uh, Satyagraha, is what um, Extinction Rebellion is all about. Um, putting something that you care about and love so much before any sort of um, personal sacrifice. 
how do you get there? How do you get to that place in yourself where you're able to, to love the world, right? Joanna Macy talks about, you know, the love of the world, which requires grief. If you're not grieving for the world, you're not fucking alive, you know? Like you're gonna burn out. You're not gonna be um, successful as a uh, activist if you don't do the grieving work. Um, and I think psychedelics can help us with that grieving work, right? Especially in a community setting of other, um, uh, you know, a sangha of, of other like-minded believers that the earth and all uh, beauty uh, of the exquisite complexity of, of life um, in, in all of its forms and all of its dimensions is worth sacrificing one's own attachments in whatever form they come, including bodily integrity to and for and with. So um, yeah, I, I think that um, it's inevitable. It was inevitable. It's inevitable that these two movements come together. You know, we call it head, heart, and hands. We call it, you know, the, the, uh, the meditators need, and by meditators, you could say the psychedelic people also, need to become activists to complete their circuit, to actually realize their potential. And the activists need to reconnect with their um, um, saving power, right? Uh, in order, to, in, in order to, you know, keep on going, to endure, right? And nonetheless, they persisted because of help with others, because of also these healing substances when used correctly, because whatever curses and spells had been put upon us by who knows what, who, when, where, it is immaterial. What's material is that we do something about it now. All the history, all the stories, fuck it. But what we need to do is opt out in every single way possible. And because we're not being harem scarum about this, you know, it's not willy nilly that uh, <clears throat> Utah Phillips says, the earth is not dying, the earth is being killed. And the people killing the earth have names and addresses. This is not to say, of course, that we can't divest in our own lives in whatever ways possible, but the structures in which we operate, in which we meet our needs, is controlled by giant transnational corporations, which have wedded with the state to form what Lewis Mumford called the mega machine, and which Fabian Scheidler wrote in his excellent book, sold a million copies in German before it was translated to English, the end of the mega machine, which I, suggest everybody reads, it's very depressing. You might wanna follow up with Nurturing Your Humanity by uh, Ryan Eisler after that. Uh, but um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Please. Um, I was wondering- Can you say your names too? Eddie. Eddie. I'm Tobias. Tobias. Um, so I was wondering whether you ever have, and like, you know, uh, you, you mentioned this cultural anthropological approach, right? To some degree, you know, if I go on the hallucinogenic trips, then I become increasingly aware of that I'm actually a primate, you know, the human myth, myth of the, 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 the organizational myths in our brain just disappear, right? But the end conclusion for me always, I'm wondering if you have the same thing sometimes, that like, I don't need activism because um, like in, you can, if you take the other, if you don't take the non bodhisattva software approach in Buddhism, why would I change anything? Because like, it's, like, why, why, why the, 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 the uh, it's about, you cannot help, you cannot help. <laughs> it's about me being, of course it is. It's about me being of in a particular place. It's, it's about, and uh, letting go of those things. Yes, of course, <laughs> of course. So, but any and all light enlightenment, if you take a panpsychist view, is, is not either or, right? right? So, I mean, ultimately that's what it comes down to. Like, the, I, so I'm disqualifying your question as, as, as a, uh, question that adheres to a logic that would uh, be part of this way of conceiving the world, which I set up. Because there you are making the distinction between the inner and the outer, the personal and the political, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm saying, show me where, show me, show me. Like, I, I, I don't believe it. I can't disconnect these things. Yeah. 
Next question. Online. Oh, we're waiting for someone else. Can I just push push a little bit on yeah. what you were saying earlier? Uh, non binary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Interesting language that we use, though, right? Uh, uh, what we, what we, Push, pushing on things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's true, true. Um, no, I, I guess, I guess you're, 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 it sounds like you're a few steps down this path more than, than I am. I don't, uh, I also reject that claim. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're, you're possessed of certain information perhaps that and, and I also uh, reject the, the claim actually. that information is a thing. Okay, <laughs> okay you felt certain emotions that I have felt. Sure. <laughs> At least this <laughs> left. Who knows? And also older than you. And you, you generally want to respect your elders, definitely. <laughs> you'll get behind that. So so it's it's more uh, so um, not your olders, but your elders. Elders indeed. So um what what's I hope I'm not espousing any faulty paradigms uh, by asking this, but, but, but what are practical steps? What, what do we need to do? Because I think we all sort of know how these- What's meetings, your question? But, 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 uh, so we, we all know that sort of meetings like this, you know, we all sort of go home at the end of the day and carry on with our normal lives. Do you? Uh, generally. <laughs> okay, um, speak for yourself. And that's, and that's yeah, so that it, it's like, what, what steps do we need to take like, practically to break out of the paradigm, you know, to, to escape? I should have worn my organized shirt, like with the organized fish. Yeah. So make friends with people and really be friends with them and learn what friendship means yeah. and then go do things that friends do that only friends can do together, which subvert the dominant paradigm while having fun. Yeah. 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 I, love to think, I love to think I'm doing a dish of that already. So, yeah. And you're great, dude. You're, you're golden. <laughs> well, I've got, I've got a question which um, will integrate some of you. I'll come back to you in a minute, Kristen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just realized you couldn't actually see me. So there's this interesting idea then, <clears throat> which you criticized about turning psychedelics, taking away the psyche out of psychedelics and the delics for that matter, exploring the mind. That's what they mean, right? So if you take away the phenomenology, you're not really, I mean, it's a sort of misnomer to call them psychedelics, of course. Um, but like thinking about your work, Celia, with uh, ketamine, and it seems like a mechanism of therapeutic action is quite often the phenomenology itself. You know, you see your, your, yourself or what remains of yourself in a grander scheme of things, and you sort of realize that your personal issues that you've taken so importantly in the past are, you know, in the grand scheme of things, relatively irrelevant. Um, so it seems that if you can turn these molecules uh, into something non-phenomenological, if they are therapeutic, it would be surely a different mechanism of therapy, right? I mean, I put that to you, but I also put it to anyone out here like Celia or people who work on this. No, I, I think it's ego, ultimately. <laughs> so that's what I was wondering. I mean, the idea of, I think that's what you were saying, sorry, I came a bit late. Um, but yeah, the, the, the idea that you can remove the phenomenological aspect is super futile and you get to both in the chain. But then I don't know, I don't know enough about this. I mean, I, I get your point, right? That if extractive capitalism takes away any uh, or completely undermines you know, like revolutionary capacity, so do you think there might be a kind of more optimistic reading that maybe they may have potential inadvertently to subvert the system because? So a medicalized this, this or pharmaceuticalized model, you mean? Yeah, so this endeavor to make the take the trip out of tripping will end up being futile, and then these compounds remain challenging um, in the way that they are disruptive. Do you think that it's just kind of more optimistic? <laughs> well, I mean, let's let's put it this way: there's no corn on earth that remains untainted or unchanged from uh, genetic modification due to pollen and wind. Yeah. Uh, so, so you think the 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 developing in like novel cancer entities will corrupt the existing pesticides? Is that what you're saying? Well, there are many different layers that we could discuss, but <clears throat> to get a little uh, abstract or uh, metaphysical, we could talk about the oversoul of these substances and the medicines. For example, I've worked as an expert in tobacco control. For 16 years, uh, I sort of cut my teeth as a public health scientist working on tobacco. I still work on tobacco. I still publish on tobacco, harm reduction, uh, pharmaceuticalization, the environmental harms of tobacco. You can just Google scholarly and see all that. 
through understanding how the oversold of tobacco has been so corrupted and abused. And so most people think of tobacco as the tobacco you buy from one of the, uh, you know, basically two transnational corporations that own all the other tobacco companies. Um, and the 7,000 chemicals in it, and the fact that two, one, uh, one in every two people who smoke for their entire life die from tobacco. The, it, I mean, just I, the horrors that the tobacco industry has unleashed. Has that been good for tobacco? Do, do you think people have been emancipated by that? No, you're going. But I have become a champion of tobacco. I didn't smoke a cigarette or anything like that. Well, I did lots of other stuff, but I, I did not touch tobacco until I was 30 years old when I was trained properly by curanderos and curanderas, how tobacco works and what it does. And so I always have tobacco with me because I know that tobacco is to pray with only and any other abuse will kill you and the planet. And you are creating more wetico on this earth by abusing tobacco, by feeding the demon of whatever the tobacco industry has unleashed. So that would be my answer. Christine. So, the sort of follows on from this. Um, we, we, we in part make very similar arguments about some of this medicalization of psychedelics, but when you gave your talk on the sort of taking the trip out of the psychedelic or of, out of, yeah, out of the whatever, that I, I think, Okay, so giving the substance without the trip and somehow taking it out in the clinical context. So you made this jump then to activism, etc. I I have recently been arguing much more close to the original point that a psychedelic. So if psychedelics help within the psychological psychiatric context, then part of it, and people have been arguing this about neuroplasticity, that the trip does something to the brain where it becomes new malleable. And so I think that one could even go as far to say is that you take the actual experience that a person can then reconstruct themselves self with in a sort of conscious dialogical process with others and think about what they have experienced, why, what to do with this and how to move on from this, especially when it was a not so happy trip experience. Um, which in therapeutic context often happens for obvious reasons that have to do with the state the person was in when she entered into the therapeutic field in the first place. So, so you, that <coughs> you actually create a mush in the brain to be sort of rude, and then you don't give the person any agency in actually putting themselves back together again in the way that they may choose in conference and dialogue with others, whether they are psychiatrists or best friends or shamans or family, or I don't, that doesn't matter, that should be their choosing, yeah? But the, there is a way in which I think that's actually positively dangerous. I think there is a massive danger in taking the trip out uh, uh, as the sort of conscious and or experience you can then reflect upon if what you believe in is effective if you think that the neuroplasticity is the thing that actually creates the opening for reorganizing what has been traumatic, for instance, and then you take the consciousness and the knowledge and the experience out of it, then you go back to MK Ultra. Yeah? Yuval Harari in <laughs> Sapiens talks about when uh, Christianity destroyed earth um, through colonialism, it wasn't enough to have just one figure Godhead. You needed the saints, you needed the angels. We needed a personification in order to make meaning of our experiences. And so that's why every little Pueblo in Mexico, as Catholic as they are, has, you know, all these little, uh, you know, Santo Antonio, like all these little names, like it's, you know, uh, Santo Tomas. Thomas, you know, we have this embodiment, this a way that we can connect with the neuroplasticity. What is neuroplasticity? Is it a thing? Is it a phenomena? Is it an aspect? Is it a ontological property that gets changed by an algorithm? What is going on there? You think that our experience of it, conscious or not, will not change 
what is actually happening on a biomolecular level, a biochemical level, a physical level. I mean, if anybody who does biophysics knows that cells are emitting light all the time. Fritz Popp uh, calls them biophotons. So there's this uh, hypothesis that um, the junk DNA, junk, right? Who called it junk? We did. Why did we call it junk? Because we were trying to instrumentalize DNA to have it do what we want. And we were seeing it through our, our, our myopic, uh, uh, what was, what's the word? Our, our uh, yeah, uh, sort of glaucoma eyes. So junk DNA may be crystals that receive signals from other cells, it's called biophotons. And I see a similar thing going on with the idea that there could be this thing called neuroplasticity, which is not impinged by our conscious experience or our unconscious experience of uh, what's going on that is also mediated by our conscious experience. Um, you know, as David Chalmers has made very clear, there's this bi-directional supervenience that goes on. It's not bottom up, it's not top down. It's all and. It's, you need to have Nagarjuna's logic in order to approach it. Thank you. Other questions? Um, so your response to Celia reminded me of her statement about uh, that the problem of our time is not materialism, it is the desecration of money. Can I ask your perspective on that? Oh, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, of course, I'm also thinking of seeing the, the separation of what, yeah, I, I mean, I would say our, our problem is separation. That's, that's the only problem. And our fear, which comes from that. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, the standard argument goes like this, right? You have um, materialism, uh, as, as, our, as our physical world, right? And that we have the throwaway culture. So we, we call ourselves materialists, but we don't care about things. You know, my computer is designed, has planned obsolescence. It's designed to break within 18 months, just like our phones. And this is good for the companies because they make more money, et cetera, et cetera, but it destroys our earth. And I don't get to really get to know the beast before it dies, right? It's like these poor, like, uh, little dogs that have short lifespans and can't even breathe, like pug dogs that we engineer. So we engineer our world to engineer out our intimacy with them, right? And we see this as progress, of course, uh, for GDP and profit and all that. Um, but I'm wondering if it's like that simple, you know, that we, we call ourselves materialists, but we actually are desecrating our material world. Um, what, I'm wondering like, what sort of work do we get when we're okay with saying, oh yes, like, let me uh, whip myself, beat myself for desecrating the world, right? This to me too often manifests as the, you know, environmental guilt. Like I don't recycle enough, right? And I don't think that's actually what's going on. I think that if you give a culture that's used to taking a banana, peeling it, eating it, throwing the banana peel, and that makes the earth more fecund. And you give them candy bars with wrappers, and that plastic destroys the fecundity. They're not doing anything wrong. They are being animals, like uh, your colleague uh, said, right? But the way that we have created our products, instrumentally, single metrically, um, so our partner university in Rotterdam, right next door is Taten Delft. And their motto for 400 years is Maten is Weten. To measure is to know, right? And so the idea is when we have this way of measuring something, that's how we know it, without taking into account that the measure itself is producing the knowledge, right? This is like STS 101, you could say. Um, but what, what I think is really interesting there is um, when we have an instrumentalized idea of the thing we want to do, 
it results in creating structures which preclude us from taking sacred because we are only latching on to a single aspect. And the triple gem, right, of, of experience of it is that, or, or as Charles Sanders first calls it, the triadicity is the, uh, the infinite alphabet. It's, it's, it's the infinite uh, interpretive cycle, right? It's the loop, which is beyond any comprehension. It literally breaks the left hemisphere's command and control structure. So, because it's too hard for us to make us responsible for making things not sacred, as if we could do that, you know, <laughs> and, and as if like that was something that we could fix just by, you know, <laughs> lighting a candle and burning some sweet grass to, you know, invite friendship. Right. So, you know, I, I think that we definitely have to approach things on the structural level and on a phenomenological one, just like Habermas says in the first and second volumes of uh, a communicative, uh, Theorie de Communicative Handel, right? He has two volumes, one's from a phenomenological uh, perspective, taking Durkheim, and the other is taking Luhmann, you know, in this sort of structural level. And I think that we need to approach strategically the, the problem of um, damaged subjectivities, uh, which is also throwaway materialism, the idea that we can just go to another planet and get more. Yeah. Gabor Mate is super clear on this. You know, I would say he's, he's the addiction expert of our time, and he's not just talking about drug addiction. Like addiction isn't an isolated manner. Like just look at the, we, we had this discussion earlier, Bruce Alexander's um, Rat Park, right? He has this new book, uh, well, 10 years old at this point, The Globalization of Addiction. Addiction is fractal, addiction is wetico. So it's not mind, it's not matter, it's all of the above and more that we have no idea about. And so that's why I think it's less strategic um, to say, oh, we're desecrating the earth. Yes, of course we are. But Joanna Macy says, we need some people who are um, putting, their, putting their fingers in the gears, stopping the machine. We need other people developing new alternative structures like what Mr. Fuller says, don't just fight against the machine. And I think he's probably misinterpreted here by a lot of tech bros uh, who say, oh yeah, don't worry about global capitalism. Let's just invent the Bitcoin, you know, the next big thing, right? But Fuller does say, you know, invest your energy in making the alternative that you want. Like, you know, be, be the change you wish to see in the world, but create the sexy alternative that's so sticky, so mimetic that it leaves Facebook, Twitter, all that, uh, sort of controlled uh, squid in uh, <laughs> uh, occupied, um, uh, you know, infrastructure behind. That the infrastructure loses its meat and becomes just bones, no life, right? And then you can create something else. And then once they settle down for a while, then you can grind up the bones and make fertilizer for your garden. <laughs> okay, one final question. Any final questions? Go on, Renee. Hi, thank you for a great talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, so you talk about like taking the trip, leaving the trip in or out. How about like the, the shades in between that or like the nature of the trip? So I guess like kind of the two related questions, like one what about like tailoring the experience, and do you think like certain substances are good for certain therapeutic purposes? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess like have another way of putting that is do you think they have different therapeutic potentials based on the experience they use? And second, what are your thoughts on um, uh, synthetic psychedelics towards that area? Those are two very good questions. Thank you. I'll answer the second one first. Um, I personally don't truck with synthetics because it's just not my interest. And, you know, you could, I, I, I think it would be too facile for me to fall back on my proscriptive versus prescriptive bit. But, I am less interested, just personally. I, I don't think that they have no potential. I think that there is you know, some real beauty that can come of that. Um, and I am, you know, tip my hat to Albert Hoffman and all the uh, great chemists who have come before and you know, really been great humanitarians as well. 
And so I think that it's about intention in part. What are you trying to do with it? You know, and, and how do you work with it and how do you present it? And so this is all part of the set and setting, right? It's part of the ecodelic of the substance. So how are you making the synthetic more ecodelic? How are you creating a culture around it? Like sight. Okay, cool, groovy. Like meditation, you know, whatever. And the MA, like I don't work personally um, in, in my investigation on with synthetics, but that's just my personal path because I serve Pachamama. Um, and that's just my, my dharma, you could say. The spectrum, right? No trip out, trip in. Yes, it is a spectrum. It is a spectrum. You know, people can have micro, meso, and macro doses. Um, and I would not, even though personally I am, um, you know, a friend of mine told me like microdosing on psilocybin, especially using it for work purposes, um, can actually be destructive, you know, because you're not breaking through, you're not having that confrontation, you're not actually. Um, feeling the existential sort of thanatos uh, uh, immensity of existence. And, and thus you are not able to become um, more resilient, but actually more fragile, right? So, you know, these are the activism. Um, at the same time, do I think that these substances always need to be taken in a like full dose um, ceremonial context? And when I say ceremonial, I'm of course referring to uh, traditional indigenous uh, practices. Um, no, I don't think. I think that people can do really good work on their own, really good work with, say, a middling dose, um, with the right intention, with the right set and setting. Then they make it ecodelic, as we all should. So I, I do think that um, we should do our best to be in integrity with the source uh, origins, the cultivation of these, uh, uh, of these entheogens. Um, for example, with peyote, I'll give an example, since I'm wearing a peyote bracelet, <laughs> from the huicharica, the huicholes, the maracanes. Um, right now, the Western lust for peyote is the demand is larger than the supply, right? So that's a big problem. Like we are again, taking from the indigenous. We are again doing uh, colonialism. And that I think is fundamentally wrong. However, some friends of mine around the world, they have figured out that when you graft peyote onto Watuma, uh, San Pedro cactus, it actually grows way faster, potentiates it. The medicine is not quite as strong, but it, you know, if you want to have a ceremony with people, that is a more sustainable way to do it, right? Um, especially for our like Western appetites of not getting the message the first time. Um, and so I think that these sort of practices really need to be taken into account and taken seriously. And um, that we should not, you know, just like pop pills or <laughs> however it is that it, whatever it is, if it's a microdose, a mesodose, or a macrodose, that we should not be trying to genetically modify these, these beings. And we should not harm, but rather cuidar the, the oversoul of these, uh, of these uh, entities, of these allies. Well, I want to ask you about the oversoul, but that's for the puff. So can we all thank you, Yandis. Okay, well, um, I think we'll go to the mill on the X, I imagine, if you want to continue the conversation. Otherwise, I'll see you in two weeks with Wayne Hall. Thank you. Mm -hmm.